guys, mm, mm, welcome back to the channel. Mm, mm, that quite frankly, mm, mm, produces nothing but mind blowing theories that don't always blow your mind. Mm. But what can I say? At least we tried. Mm. Sal Aragon Mander mm, mm, here. I'm back with. Mm, a double whammy of Ruby theories this episode. And then while the last video didn't exactly have Ruby fans exactly too pleased, as I'm sure, being that I haven't really seen what happened on that video, I'm guessing Ruby fans were watching it just for the grim analysis. But, if I got time, I'll do another grim analysis in this video after throwing you guys my double whammy of Ruby theories. Also, I want to go back to my ultimate Ruby theory video. One particular part... And I realized and I made a bit of a mistake, not Son of the Sun for Neo, but rather Cars as a whole. And keep that in mind, you guys. But anyways, I'd really like to believe that we've actually seen the last of that ruddy Good for nothing criminal um, Roman Torchwick, but something started nagging at the back of my mind here recently. Shortly after I actually posted my last video, as a matter of fact, the fact that Roman Torchwick could still be alive. Yeah, you heard me right. Roman Torchwick, alive and well. The reason for this is, is the fact that while we see him getting eaten, after he's about to basically deal the finishing blow to Ruby, or something like that, where he beats Ruby to a bloody pulp, he gets swallowed whole by a griffin. Many people say he gets eaten, and that's the end of it, but unfortunately, my mind, being the mind of a theorist, my mind has to point to the contrary, because, one, Roman Torchwick was swallowed by a griffin. He wasn't exactly eaten. And being the fact that griffins typically lack teeth, it's easy... It's easy to say that this is mm, was part one of the evidence mm, mm, supporting mm, mm, Torchwick's mm, mm, being alive. The second part, on the other hand, though, is a little bit more mm, of an enigma, mm, being the fact that mm, the griffin is never seen after it mm, swallows Torchwick. After Ruby makes her escape, the griffin... Mm, whose fate is left unknown. Ruby manages to make her escape, and the griffin is actually distracted by something else, who's allowing Ruby to make an escape. And after that, we never get to know what happens to the griffin in all... Mm, the rest of the series. Therefore, we may very well actually end up seeing Roman Torchwick showing up again. And Neo... She's a given. She's gonna come around. But that's theory number one. Theory number two, on the other hand, has to do not with the Ruby series itself, but rather 
what happens in between volumes two and three. Because we lack a specific time frame between the school dance and the vital festival tournament's beginning, we lack any idea of when the vital festival tournament occurs relative to the school dance. Taking that into account, we can only assume that there is about a two to three two to three months time span in that between the time that Ruby and Company returned to Beacon and the amount of and the amount of time spent building towards the Vital Festival Tournament. As a matter of fact, the Vital Festival Tournament could very well happen quite some time afterwards. I'd give it no more than five months after the after the major grim attack on Vale. All things considered, that is more than enough time to allow for the events of Grim Eclipse to possibly take place. And, being the fact that there is obviously a discrepancy between video games and anime and cartoon series, we can obviously assume that we can obviously assume that a lot of the events that occur in Grim Eclipse are occurring separately and within the main Ruby timeline. In other words, yeah, we've got... We have the potential for Grim Eclipse to actually be occurring between Volumes 2 and 3. We also have a possibility that some of the events in Grim Eclipse could very well ha occur between Volumes 3 and 4. However, due to the fact that we currently lack information and storyline to go off of, this theory as of right now is going to remain up in the air. And, yeah, that's the second theory. Now, on to Grim Analysis. First of all, we have Nevermores, then we have Deathstalkers. I do King Tai Chi, but I still need to do research on that score. One of my rare subjects that are kind of an enigma to where I'm concerned. But anyways, as far as Nevermores are concerned, that's basically an Edgar Allan Poe reference. To, with the Raven and Nevermore, but yeah, that that's the Nevermore from Ruby. I don't really have a whole lot on that. I'll probably do a bit more groundwork in a later Grim Analysis episode, but that's for another episode. In the meantime, allow me to explain Deathstalkers. Those have a lot more history behind them, and like Pyrrha, and like Pyrrha Nikos, Deathstalkers actually have some Greek myth, Greek mythology inspiration behind them. Specifically, the tale of Orion. The story goes as follows. Orion had 
unsuccessfully hunted down and killed beasts that was that had been terrorizing a local village. At that point, upon slaying the beast, Mr. Ryan declared that he would slay all the beasts of the earth. Now, you can imagine that someone wasn't too happy about this, specifically Gaia, the mother of all beasts. As the, all be, the beasts of the earth were her children, she was none too happy about Orion's declaration. So, in response, Gaia actually created a giant scorpion-type creature, which was named Scorpio. Scorpio, being as massive a creature as it was, was hunted down Orion and then proceeded to engage Orion in combat. Orion soon found that he was no match for the creature and turned to flee. So that way he might have a chance of actually living long enough to regret his mistakes. Unfortunately, Scorpio had other plans and thereby proceeded to run its stinger through Orion's back straight through Orion's heart. In response to Orion's death, the Olympians put Orion in the sky as a constellation. Orion is very well easy to spot in the night sky on account of the three stars that make his belt. On the other hand, though, unfortunately for Orion, Gaia sent Scorpio up into the night sky after Orion to chase... So Ryan across the night sky. And, yeah, to this day, Orion is constantly running from Scorpio in order so that he may actually stand a chance. But, unfortunately, it is a chase that will span across an eternity. Or at least as long as the Earth continues to rotate, and then we have night and day. But, that's the story of Orion, in a nutshell. Actually, not so much a nutshell as basically the whole story, but, anyways, Scorpio is obviously the inspiration for Deathstalkers here. As the first, and as a matter of fact, the first time we even see a Deathstalker in the Ruby series is when we are, is when Pyrrha is being chased by a Deathstalker. Pyrrha being inspired by Achilles is a huntress and Orion was a hunter so you can pretty much see the correlation there. So yeah, Deathstalker is obviously a nod towards the Greek myth of Orion. But yeah, that's the end of that grim analysis. I'll bring in more grim analysis episodes in the future, along with more mind-blowing theories. So, yeah. Other than that, I'd like to give a shout-out to Rooster Teeth for providing me with materials for these fantastic theories that I've been doing. Good job, guys. Also, I'd like to send a shout-out to Mercedes Lackey for producing works that I can enjoy reading in my spare time. 
And just one final shout out to all you viewers out there for helping this channel continue to have inspiration for further theories and whatnot. But, being as I'm running short on time, I may as well wrap this up. If you want well, if you want to subscribe, be sure to do so. Zayhalva.